Turn with me to the book of Esther in the Old Testament, the book of Esther. Over the past few weeks, we looked at the post-exilic books of the Old Testament, which are those Old Testament books that take place, that are set after Israel's return from Babylonian exile. So we looked at First and Second Chronicles, and Ezra and Nehemiah, and then the three prophets that ministered during that time period, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And the last of those books is the book of Esther. That's what I want us to look at this evening. But instead of looking at it in one night as we did the others, we'll, we'll look at this book over the course of four Sunday nights, taking it section by section and watching its major theme and ideas develop. Now, the book of Esther takes place in ancient Susa, which is modern-day Iran. So in that part of the world is where the book of Esther takes place. And it's set during the reign of Xerxes I, or depending on your translation, it may refer to him as Ahasuerus, difference between his Persian and his Hebrew name. And he ministered during the years 486 to 465. And you say, okay, what's what's the significance of those dates? Well, that comes between the first and the second wave of returnees from exile. So if you remember from when we looked at the book of Ezra, you had Cyrus's decree in 525.19, which said all of the Jews living in Babylon can now return home. And there was a major wave of exiles that returned home. You read about that in Ezra chapter 1. They laid the foundation of the temple and began to restore worship back in Palestine. Then several years later, about 30, 35 years later, you had your second wave of returnees from exile. This is the group that was led by Ezra. You read about this in Ezra chapter 7. Well, the book of Esther falls between those two returns from exile and centers not on a group of exiles going back home to Palestine, but to Jews who are still living in the Persian Empire. You remember the Babylonians exiled the Jews. Eventually, the Babylonians fell to the Persians. The Persians permitted them to return, but not all returned after that initial decree, a decree, many remain behind, and Esther focuses on those folks. And the story centers around a few main characters. You have the young Jewish woman named Esther. You have her cousin Mordecai. And the book will focus on their interactions with the Persian government, particularly King Xerxes and the nobleman Haman, the way they interact, creates the tension within the story. And like many of Israel's stories, the tension here is on the Jews facing extermination at the hands of a foreign nation. In this instance, the Persians. But that's a common theme throughout Scripture, whether it's the Egyptians, whether it's the Babylonians, the Persians, the Moabites, whether it's Herod and his minions. In the New Testament, you go read Revelation 12, you've got the dragon pursuing the woman and all of her children. It's a common theme in Scripture that the devil persecutes the people of God. And in this story, it's the Persians persecuting the Jewish people. And throughout this book, we're going to see how God works powerfully, yet seemingly invisibly, in order to save his people from destruction. And that theme of God's invisible working, that's one of the main features of this book. Because if you read this book, if you go home and you read this book cover to cover, you you come all four nights that we look at Esther, here's what you're going to not hear. From the pages of this book, you're never going to hear God specifically mentioned. Now, we're going to talk about God. But as we read the text, you will notice that God is never directly referred to In the book of Esther, there are no references to his name. There are no references to his word. There's no reference even to God in general, which is an interesting situation. The Bible is all about God's purpose to rescue his people, yet this book, Esther, appears to omit 
the main character. But as we go through the story, I think you're going to see that that's intentional. It's an intentional absence. The author of the book of Ezra has written his story in the way he has in order to make the powerful point that God is working even when he does not appear to be. That God's work, though invisible, is no less powerful. And the people in this story, they may not be in the promised land, but they're still under God's protection. They don't even attribute their motives to God directly, but God still uses them. No miracles take place in the book of Esther, but God's power is still clearly evident. So let's work through tonight the first two chapters and see how this story and this theme begins to develop. Let's read together the opening nine verses of Ezra. Ezra chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. The word of God says, This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Cush. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. The military leaders of Persia and Medea, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. For a full 180 days he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. When these days were over, the king gave a banquet, lasting seven days, in the enclosed garden of the king's palace for all the people from the least to the greatest who were in the citadel of Susa. The garden had hangings of white and blue linen fastened with cords of white linen and purple material to silver rings on marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. Wine was served in goblets of gold, each one different from the other, and the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions, for the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. Amen. We'll end our initial reading there. And what these verses do is they set up the story for us. Here we are in the Persian Empire during the reign of King Xerxes. And in the third year of his reign, He gives a seven-day banquet for all of his nobles and officials. There's 180 days of celebration leading up to this. And finally, a seven-day banquet for the nobles and officials. Now, this likely corresponds to an event from history known as the Great War Council of 483 B.C. It was held by the Persians to plan and rally support for the invasion of Greece. So when you compare Esther with some of the uh, non-biblical historical sources, these events appear to match. The Persians were planning to invade Greece, and this is the council that uh, they organized in order to plan it and to muster up support throughout the kingdom. And this seven-day banquet, it takes place in the enclosed garden of the king's palace, complete, as we read, with beautiful and costly decorations, wine served without restriction. The text highlights that, the king's liberality. He he said to these men, you can drink as much as you want. And that that might seem a little strange. We're going to conduct a war council when we're drunk. But Persians actually deliberated these kinds of matters, matters of state, under the influence of alcohol because they believed that inebriation put them in closer touch with the gods and they needed the gods' support in order to win the war. So they got good and drunk, that put them in touch with the gods and that they therefore earned their support. How, how good is it to know that major decisions in world history were made while people were drunk in order to gain the support? Of the gods. But that's what's going on here as they plan this war council. And at the same time, during the feast, the queen, Vashti, is also having a party for the women in the royal palace. Now, at the end of the seventh day, when we read that King Xerxes was good and drunk, he summoned Queen Vashti to come display her beauty. At his party. And the text says that he sent seven eunuchs to fetch her. Probably what was going to happen is they were going to carry her in on the royal litter. She was going to make a very, uh, a very elaborate entrance here as queen and a major figure 
of the state. And the reason, the most likely reason that Xerxes wanted her there is that when people saw her in her royal attire, when they saw her wearing her crown, it would inspire patriotism. It would inspire loyalty to the king's cause. Think of of events in Britain when the queen appears. It inspires the people to see the head of state. That's probably what Xerxes is after. But the queen refuses to come. And you can imagine then in a period of of, of gaining patriotism, trying to rally support, oh, what a scandal this would have been to the court for the queen to refuse to come. Now, we don't know her exact reason for refusing. The text doesn't tell us. It is possible if we compare Esther with, like I said, some non-biblical historical sources, there is a person known to us in history as Amestris, one of King Xerxes' queens. And if she is the same person as Vashti, then at this period in time, she would have been in the late stage of her pregnancy with Xerxes' son. She may not have wanted to make a public appearance in the late stages of her pregnancy. Now, the text doesn't tell us that, and that's built, that's based on a historical reconstruction. It may not match perfectly, but that's one possible reason for why the queen refused to appear. Whatever the reason is, her refusal incensed Xerxes. So, what does the king do? Well, he does what many husbands do when they feel slighted. He calls his buddies together and says, how can we get back at my wife for treating me in this manner? And one of the more perceptive of the wise men, this guy must have been really, uh, had a happy marriage. He warns the king that, listen, Queen Vashti's refusal might become widely known. And if everybody in the kingdom finds out that your own wife and queen won't listen to you, then none of the other women in the kingdom will listen to their husbands, and then we're going to have a total societal collapse. I mean, that's what they said. That was their advice to the king. And in order to prevent that then, they counsel the king to dismiss Vashti from her position as queen and to let another take her place. This threat that, that all the support and all of the, all of the goodwill that's been drummed up, and not to mention the possible effects in all the other Persian homes, it's, it's too much of a risk to let her keep her position. She must be dismissed. And so the king did that, and he then sent dispatches throughout the entire Persian empire, informing everyone what he had done and reminding the men in his empire to rule over their house. And though, thus read the end of chapter 1, look at verses 21 and 22. The king and his nobles were pleased with this advice, so the king did as Membucan proposed. He sent dispatches to all the parts of the kingdom, to each province in its own script, and to each people in their own language, proclaiming that every man should be ruler over his own household using his native tongue. So Queen Vashti is removed. Now, as we come into chapter 2, with Queen Vashti dismissed, now the search begins for a new queen. And in order to find a replacement, the king's officials, they essentially conduct a beauty contest throughout the entire kingdom. All of the applicants, all of the women who, who would like to become the new queen are given beauty treatments for one year. And they're brought to Susa, the capital city, and they live together, and from that group, the king would make his choice. Now, there just happened to be living in Susa at this time a Jew from the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai. He had grown up in exile and he had a cousin whose parents were deceased and Mordecai had raised this cousin as if she were her daughter. Her name was Hadassah, although she is more commonly referred to as Esther. And with the king's beauty contest in process, Mordecai submits Esther as a contestant. But before he sends her off, he gives her an important command. Don't tell anybody that you're a Jew. Keep your nationality secret. Now, we're not told again what what Mordecai's motive for hiding Esther's nationality was. Maybe he thought she would have no chance of being selected if everybody knew that she was a Jew. Jews were not necessarily well thought of by the Persians, as we'll see in the following nights together. What's also interesting about Mordecai's action is this is a very different course of action from, say, Daniel and his friends. 
They lived in Babylonian exile, and they were very clear. We are Jews. We worship the one true and living God. We won't eat pagan food. And if you trust us to follow this course of action, you'll see that God will take care of us. A very different approach from Mordecai with reference to his nationality. There's no commentary made on whether Mordecai's course of action is right or wrong. It's simply the choice he makes. And as we'll see, it's the one that God chooses to use in the outworking of his plan. So Esther begins her 12 months of beauty treatment. And she's very beautiful. The text makes that point. She is so beautiful that even the king's servants conducting the beauty contest began to notice. Now, here's how the rules work. When it was your time to appear before the king, you went and visited his palace for a day. And if he liked you, he would summon you back. You were not allowed to return to his palace unless he called for you. And if he did not summon you, that meant you were not going to be the new queen. Well, when the time came for Esther to appear before the king, she won his approval more than any of the other girls who had visited. And thus Esther was installed as the new king. Look at chapter 2, or the new queen, excuse me, chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women. And she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. And that's as far into the story as we will go tonight. So what can we take away from these first two chapters. Well, so far we've met three out of our four main characters. We've met Esther, we've met Mordecai, we've met King Xerxes. In the next message, we will meet the fourth main character, Haman or Haman. And as we've said earlier, the one character who hasn't been mentioned yet is God. But as we go through the whole story, he will never be directly mentioned. And this is on purpose, as I've said, by the author in order to show us that God controls every circumstance of our life, that God works powerfully yet often invisibly, controlling every circumstance of our life in order to do good to his people. That's really the theme of the whole book, and we'll see it developed throughout the coming nights. How have we seen that theme touched on just tonight? I think we've seen it in three ways. First, God controls every circumstance of life. God controls every circumstance of life. Think about the situation that we've encountered, that we've landed in in this book. Other than applying, which actually Mordecai himself did, Esther did nothing to bring herself to this position. She did nothing to enter into this position as queen. Mordecai submitted her name. She was not a key player in being born or growing up. There in Babylon, Uh, it wasn't her choice to be a parentless. It wasn't her choice to be born or to live there, excuse me, in Persia. It was God working behind the scenes. God shaping the circumstances of life in order to put Esther in the position while where she would eventually become queen. One study Bible says this, God fulfills his redemptive purposes, not only through great miracles, but also through divine providence, working through ordinary events. These things that we've read today, on one hand, they just look at normal things. The events of state, the events of, of, of a king choosing a queen, the, the situation of everyday life for Mordecai and Esther. But God is present in this. When we see where the story is going, we're going to see that it was God's hand all along working out the salvation of his people. God is powerfully present even when he is most conspicuously absent. And he's not dependent on our good works in order to do his plan. Like I said, no commentary is made on the moral nature or the motives of Esther or Mordecai. We don't know why it is that Mordecai tells her to keep her nationality a secret, why that is so different from, say, Daniel and his friends. But these are the means, nonetheless, that God chooses to use in order to work out his eternal purpose. So God controls every circumstance of life. Secondly, every circumstance in life ultimately contributes to God's plan. 
All right, so God controls every circumstances of our life. And then on the flip side, everything that happens in your life is for God's plan. Nothing in life goes wasted. Think about it. God was shaping Esther's circumstances from the very beginning so that she could eventually gain this position as queen. If she wasn't parentless, she wouldn't have been raised by Mordecai. If she hadn't been raised by Mordecai, he wouldn't have submitted her name. If God had not chosen to make her beautiful, she would not have won this position. If she hadn't been a Jew living in exile to begin with, she never would have achieved her position as queen. Everything that God gives us and everything that God does not give us is for his eternal purpose. No detail or circumstance of your life is a waste or a mistake or something that God is not using for his glory. Ephesians 1.11 says we've been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Jeremiah 1.5 to the prophet, God says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. What God had for Jeremiah contributed to the way God shaped him in the womb. What God has for you in bringing about his saving purpose in your life and and growing you in grace, God is working out everything in your life to achieve that purpose. And thirdly and finally, truth illustrated right here in the book of Esther, everything that God does is good and is for our good, especially our salvation. And that's what this story is all about. God doing all things good For our salvation. As we'll see in the coming weeks, this is a story about rescue. God rescuing his people from destruction. God preserving his people in order to continue his saving purposes. Think about it. There has to be an Israel in order for there to one day be a Messiah. If Jesus is going to come as a seed of Abraham and bless the world by dying and rising again, there has to be an Israel in place for Jesus to come from Israel. God is preserving Israel in order to continue his redemptive purposes, to bring salvation to the world. And that mercy extends to his people even when they're outside of the promised land, even when their circumstances aren't ideal. Not even exile could prevent these people from enjoying God's merciful protection. And that calls to mind Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God controls every circumstance in life in order to do good to his people. We've seen that initially here tonight in Esther, and we're going to see that again in the coming weeks. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for your mercies towards us. Thank you for your faithfulness to your people. Thank you.